This is going to be a continuation, however, of many of the themes that we've been reviewing throughout the prophetic conference, um, especially the things that I have been reviewing. A few of those primarily are dealing with, first and foremost, the reality of the priesthood of the believer. How many of you know that you are kings and priests before the Lord? You really are, and, and the reality of the believer's priesthood, that truth has been one of the most assaulted truths in the church, in the body of Christ, historically. And one of the things we're seeing happen right now is where I've used this phrase several times, accelerating towards revival, towards another, I believe, more than, more than just a revival, I believe we're going to experience another great awakening. I think we're coming into something that actually is going to be on the scale uh, of, of something that eclipses what we saw in the 1800s through Wesley and Whitfield, what, what we saw in the 1700s through Edwards, uh, what we saw through the Jesus movement. I think God is in the business of glory to glory, of increase, and I think what we're coming into is going to eclipse that. And it takes a revelation of the fact that all of us are in the believer's priesthood. It really does. As simple as that truth is, it is no less profound in its simplicity, and you'd be surprised at how greatly the church has been robbed of their identity when it comes to that. And part of the message we're going to be dealing with in a moment is tackling this whole issue of unworthiness. I'm convinced that that is one of the greatest stumbling blocks to keeping us from stepping into everything that God has for us, that for whatever reason... He can use my neighbor, he can use a Randy Clark or a Chad Everett or me or a William or whoever our heroes in the faith are, but there's just something in me that's in no one else that disqualifies me from what God's already qualified me to step into. And then we end up placing external limitations on our qualification, and the problem is God never places them. He never places them. In fact, he flips the script because we're in an upside-down kingdom. And we see a consistent pattern of the seeking out of Gideons. We see a consistent pattern of, of, of things like what occurred through the story of uh, Ruth and Boaz and uh, the birth of Obed, who's the great-grandfather of Jesus, making Ruth the great-grandmother of Jesus Christ. And the problem was Ruth didn't fit in to the bloodline by their, by their standards. I, I wish I had time to to teach on that, but we, we see God seeking out these people, seeking out the Davids who are not brought in amongst the rest of the brothers. Going down into the crevices, going to the lowly, this is what God does in the kingdom. And when the spirit being poured out is, is prophesied, and there's many passages, but one of the most key is in the book of Joel from the prophet Joel, and he prophesies about what will take place when we come into this dispensation of the spirit that you and I are in right now. In, in one sense, you and I have been in a revival, and when I say you and I, the body, the body of Christ has been in an ongoing revival in the age of the spirit since Acts chapter 2, when the spirit fell and the church was birthed. In one sense, we've We've been in that, but Joel prophesies, and he says that when the Holy Spirit comes, that he's going to be poured out on all flesh, and he goes on to say, sons and daughters will prophesy. What's he doing there? He's breaking down gender barrier. Sons and daughters will prophesy. That answers the women in ministry question. <laughs> Old men will dream dreams. Young men will receive visions. That deals with the age barrier. And then he goes on in one more thing categorically, and he says, on the servants and the handmaidens, class barrier, dismantled. I'll pour out my spirit on them. So God is systematically through Joel going down and disrupting and dealing with and tearing away every form and fashion of idol that man would lift up to say this person doesn't get to be a part of the ones that do it. I'm telling you, God in no way, shape, or form deals in elitism. Every single one of you are called as a kingdom people. Every single one of you. Whether you're in any professional 
ministry, vocational ministry or not, listen, nothing about standing on a platform produces presence. Carrying a microphone doesn't mean you carry the anointing. John tells us in his first epistle that you have been given an anointing for the Holy One, from the Holy One. That word you in the Greek means you. <laughs> you, every single one of you have been given an anointing from the Holy One. And the issue, and I've covered this in the session last night and in the afternoon, is, is we disqualify ourselves from the things that God has called us to step into. And there's many different ways and facets in which that happens, ways that take shape. And last night I primarily dealt with the idol of uh, being unwilling to be inconvenienced, unwilling to be uncomfortable. In the afternoon, I dealt with some things from a little bit more of a prophetic perspective. I'm going to do a bit of a blend of that in the time that we have left here together and going to have some form or fashion of impartation at the end. You can open up with me to John chapter 6. <laughs> Chad, you must have been preaching on these because when I said open to Luke 9, they all gave a big cheer. They just cheered about John, Chick, John 6. Or maybe you guys are just that excited about any chapter of the Bible. That's good. <laughs> right before we read from there, uh, my incredible wife, she couldn't be with me. Um, she's a much better preacher than me. So sometimes I tell her she can't come with me because if people heard her minister, I wouldn't get invited back. <clears throat> Just kidding. She couldn't be here with me, but um, she, her uh, great-great-grandfather was a man named uh, Harold Earthman. Now, none of you are going to know who this man is unless you were around uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, where he grew up during his time. He was, he was a pretty famous individual in that particular town. Uh, he was the crusade organizer and large financier for the late evangelist by the name of Mordecai Ham. Now, many of you are not going to know that name either, and that's okay. Um, Mordecai was a very anointed, very passionate evangelist, and he and Harold did many, many different crusades and uh, gospel events. There's one in particular that you can find online that records an event they put on in Charlotte, North Carolina in 1934. Now, the whole deal with this crusade is this is the one that they were trying to rally the people the most for. This is where they were putting, uh, at that point in time, the most amount of their, their intercession Targeted prayer, the largest amount of their money, their different resources, pulling everyone together. And despite all of that effort, when Mordecai gave the altar call after he preached his guts out, one person came forward. And they left that crusade, and word began to spread around the town, and the word still is circulating around Murfreesboro, Tennessee, in the expanding area about the disappointment that they felt over that crusade, because both of these men died not seeing the fruit of that one 16-year-old being Billy Graham. Absolutely true. The resulting fruit of that crusade that they interpreted as their greatest flop was really their greatest victory, their greatest triumph. And I'm telling you, the, it's the same thing for you and I. So with that being said, let's look now in this beginning portion, at least, of John chapter 6. I'm reading the, out of the uh, NIV. My friend William calls it the nearly inspired version. <laughs> Verse 1, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And by the way, what he's doing here is not giving Philip so much of an, an individualistic test, what he's doing is trying to bring Philip into a new way of thinking. And he's always doing this with his disciples and with contemporary disciples. In other words, he's not initiating miracles 
to bring our faith into increasing measures of practical provision. He's introducing miracles to bring our faith into the direction of not so much just reliance on practical provision, but reliance on the power of God. He's doing this to give Philip a new thought pattern. The word for repentance, as a matter of fact, is the word metanoia, which means a changing of the way that you think. And usually we've heard repentance preached. You're walking in this direction. You stop about face and you go the other direction. And that is an aspect of it, but that is impossible until something happens here. When God begins to imprint new ways of thinking here, only then can you be successful in changing your external direction and actions. So he's doing this to to bring Philip into a new way of thinking. In verse 7, Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, here is a boy with five, everybody say that with me, five. Five. Remember that number, small barley loaves and two small fish But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. By the way, it was, and this is very, very conservative, at least 15,000 people. When it says this, in their census, they wouldn't count the women or the children. And now they didn't have birth control. So conservatively, at least 15,000 people, because this number 5,000 is 5,000 families, not 5,000 individual men. So it gives us a different picture of just how broad this was of what Jesus was doing. He then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish when they had all had enough to eat. He said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. There's so much we could get into there, but there's just really one point in particular I want to cover. And it's with this issue of there being five loaves. Um. This is the only miracle that is in all four of the Gospels. It's in the Synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it's in John's Gospel. Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke 9, and John 6. John's just my favorite version of the story. Why I'm telling you that is because there's a second account where Jesus multiplies food again, and most people think they're the same story, and they're not. That story is only in Matthew 10 and Mark 8. And in that story, this and most theologians believe it was only about three months after this account, Jesus doesn't feed 5,000 families. He feeds 4,000. And he does it beginning with not five loaves of bread, but seven. So years ago, when I began to look at these two stories, there was just this internal spiritual itch, if you will. And uh, have you ever had something like that? Just you, You didn't quite know what God was trying to tell you. But for some reason, sometimes in in things that maybe seem like, I hate to use this word, insignificant passages to us, obscure, it's probably a better word, passages to us, you you read it and something just hits you and you can't shake it. You can't get it off of your mind. You can't get it off of your heart. And I I couldn't get over this, this one issue with these two stories. And the issue was, okay, Jesus, you did this contradictory to the way that I would think to do it in the natural. To feed the larger group of people, you started with five. To feed 4,000, you started with seven. I would think, if we're going to pray for food to multiply, let's start with the smaller amount of food to multiply for the smaller group of people. Let's start with the larger amount of bread for the larger group of people. Wouldn't you think that in the natural? So I, I couldn't shake that, and finally the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, what I'm trying to show you in this is that the less I start with, the more I intend on accomplishing. The less I start with, the more I intend on accomplishing. And there's a reason I wanted to introduce this uh, thought to you with that story of what God did through Mordecai Ham and through Harold. Their greatest victory coming out of what they thought was their greatest 
defeat. And as I said, it's no different for you and I. We could pick any of the heroes of the faith that have gone before us. We could pick someone like uh, Mariah Woodworth Eder. She was born in 1844 in Lisbon, Ohio. Uh, born into a horrible family dynamic. Extreme, extreme poverty. Her father died of a sunstroke when she was seven. She was illiterate. He got saved and the Lord supernaturally taught her how to read the Bible. And there's a quote from Mariah that I love that I'm going to insert here before we continue with the message, and it's this. She was speaking about her journey of coming to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she said, I asked the Lord to grant me the same power that he gave the Galilean fishermen to anoint me for service. I came to him like a child asking for bread, looking for it, and she ends with this, God did not disappoint me. As I said, for many of us, the only thing holding us back is a fear of disappointment. For some reason, he can't do it with me. He can do it with anybody else, but he can't do it with me. And it it restricts us from risking to see the kingdom come because we're scared that if we jump out, the net won't be there for us. But I want to challenge you and exhort you to risk like never before and watch what God does. Watch what he does as you begin to do that. We could look at a William Seymour, the catalyst of the Azusa Street outpouring, used under Jim Crow law, had to learn theology by not even being allowed to sit in the classroom because of segregation. He'd listen outside of a window and took notes. Blind in one eye, his whole family's possessions were valued at 55 cents. And God used him as the catalyst for one of the greatest revivals we've seen sweep the earth, birthing really the Pentecostal movement that we still stand in the wake of. Earl Roberts, when he was a young boy, was given a death sentence, frail, dying of tuberculosis, but visited by God and raised up as one of the great healing evangelists in the past several centuries. My mentor, Randy Clark, just before the Toronto outpouring, I mean, if you've heard of the Toronto outpouring in the 90s, Just before Toronto happened, Randy Clark was on the verge of a mental breakdown. Having tics that he couldn't control because the anxiety was so intense. Not far from here. He gets a call from a friend of his, a businessman in Texas, not a vocational minister. And this man had given Randy many prophetic words, and Randy had such little confidence in himself, he had balled up all the prophetic words that he'd written down and threw them in the trash in his office. And he gets a call from this man in Texas, and he said, Randy, the Lord's just given me the second clearest word he's ever given me for you. And Randy's response is kind of like, yeah, okay, get on with it, Richard. And his word was, Randy, the Lord says, test me now, test me now. Do not be afraid. I will back you up. I want your eyes to be open to see my resources for you in the heavenlies. And just as Elijah prayed for Gehazi's eyes to be open. And do not be anxious, for when you are anxious, you can't hear me. And that word shifted his heart to believe, I'm going now to this invitation that I've gotten to Toronto that he didn't even want to take because when he was invited to do a week of meetings, he told the pastor at the Toronto Airport Vineyard, he said, I've only got two sermons that are any good. That shifted him into believing. We're going now in an apostolic mission. We're going to see more than we've ever seen in our life. And they did. And that was used to, to catalyze the Toronto outpouring that shook the church and shook the world. And now let's shift from some revival stories into some stories of evangelism. And and I've covered this throughout the prophetic conference, but they do very much blend together. And we have to remember things like God looking at the heart and looking to see who will be faithful with the little to be trusted with much. One of the other factors you see with people who become key leaders in moves of God and revivals is they're faithful, faithful in the everyday. I want to propose this. I'm not saying stop praying for a suddenly. Keep doing that. Keep praying for an Acts 2 suddenly moment. But keep in mind that usually before there is a personal experience of a suddenly, 
there's consistency in obedience in a single direction. And when God begins to see that posture of heart, he says, I can trust them with a suddenly. I can trust them with some keys in the kingdom, if you will, in this area because they've shown themselves faithful. And so amazingly, many times it's people who begin in the most obscure and the lowest and the weakest places. But I want to share a few stories with you from my own life before we pray at the end here. And I'll try to help Holy Spirit get through these very quickly of this in action. And all of just moments where the power of God showed up in either the most mundane moments or moments of weakness where I didn't feel like I measured up. And the first one that's coming into my mind to tell you was several years ago when I, uh, before I did this full time, I traveled with Dr. Clark around the world. And this one particular trip, we were in London. We were at a church called Holy Trinity Brompton, a very, very large Anglican community. And uh, I was maybe I had maybe just turned 20 years old at the time. Everybody in this church was incredibly educated, all in three-piece suits. I was scared to death and intimidated talking to every single one of them. And I was even more intimidated to get up and do any kind of ministry. And Randy had told me, I'm going to have you come up on the platform and give words of knowledge and minister with me. I wanted to tell him no, but he was my boss, so I didn't tell him no. We get to the end, and he calls me up, and I had several words of knowledge that I felt pretty confident to give. And as I'm standing up there, I get this quick little flash. It's very, very quick word of knowledge that I actually saw. And by the way, uh, I can't teach on words of knowledge in this session, but our ministry, Global Awakening, and myself, Dr. Clark especially, have a lot of resources on words of knowledge available online. Uh, lots of them on YouTube for free. One of the ways they can happen that I want to mention here is that you can see them. Uh, most of the time, by the way, when you're looking and the Holy Spirit shows you something in, in the realm of sight, it looks like, so you can take this and remember this as a practical key, it looks like when you're on an airport strip or driving down the road in a very, very hot day and you see the glimmer of the heat sizzling off the pavement. And you can see it, but it's very, very opaque, and it's so subtle, you almost miss it. By the way, that's usually the way that God speaks and performs the greatest miracles is through the subtle and the small things. It really is. And and I remember when I first started out, I, I believed if I didn't have the Lord shout at me, like a Charlton Heston or a Morgan Freeman, Brian! You know, go and do this. I thought, okay, that's how I know it's the Lord. I've had a few of those, but I've learned it's usually the opposite. It's usually the opposite. And God's looking to to stretch us in our capacity to see, will you listen to me when it's small? So this word was small, but, but I did see it. I looked out over this crowd, and what floated in front of me was photophobia. And God said, I don't want you to give any of these other words of knowledge on your list until you give that one. And I'm standing up there, you know, trying to look calm, but inside I'm like this. And I'm thinking, God, I don't even know if that's a real thing. I'd never heard of it. Photo, I know what a phobia is. I know what photos are. Does someone have a phobia of getting their picture taken? And I'm shaking like a leaf. And finally it gets to me. Randy hands me the microphone and I... I said, uh, I had this word, I don't know if it's the Lord, but photophobia. And I stood still, but when I said it internally, again, it was like, photophobia. (laughs) About two seconds after that came out of my mouth, a woman in the very back last seat stands up wearing big four or five inch thick blacked out sunglasses, because I found out afterwards this was a kind of a rare genetic condition where you can be born with a hypersensitivity to light. She had this from birth. She was in her mid-40s. It was so severe that if she looked into it, it didn't matter if it was sunlight, UV light, you name it, she would pass out, black out, and wake up with level 10 migraines throwing up, sometimes for days at a time, for 42 years. When I said that, she heard it. She jumped up. <gasps> That's me. Rips off the sunglasses and does this, staring up into the headbeams. 
crying because she's completely healed in front of the whole church. And you want to talk about faith coming into a room, and we didn't even have to pray for about 70% of the healings that happened. It just boom, 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 boom. Like popcorn. And as amazing as that is, and with some of these other things I've experienced, I can't tell you how often I look back and I think, what if I caved into fear and intimidation and I said, God, I'm going to look so dumb when that falls flat. And I didn't do it. I think in the goodness of God, she would have been healed some, through some other way, some other person or means, but I wouldn't have gotten to be a part of it. I wouldn't have, have, I wouldn't have gotten to participate in that piece of the story of God in her life. And I think God has so much of this out there for us, so much more than we realize. So much more than we realize. <clears throat> Two more quickly. Uh, several years ago, there was a five-year-old boy that uh, I was asked to pray for at the end of, uh, this is kind of the opposite of Holy Trinity, Brompton. It was a very, very small meeting at a little house church of maybe 15 or 20 people. And I was asked to pray for this boy by his mother who was dealing with pervasive autism and a neurological disease called PANDAS. Um, it stands, I, I'm not a neurologist, so if I butcher this, forgive me. I think it stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neurological Disorder Associated with Strep. And uh, in short, it, it can be a little bit on a spectrum as well, but his, his case was very severe. It would cause him to go into violent outbursts, bang his head against the wall, lash out at his, his parents, pull out his hair, bite his tongue. They would have to physically restrain him. And uh, I've got to tell you, I didn't feel any fate at all for anything to happen. As a matter of fact, I only got to pray for him from a distance. I didn't even get to lay hands on him because he started to go into an episode while we were there in the meeting and she was bringing him forward. And so the father has to quickly take him away. And I just was listening to the mother crying and stretching out my hand and feeling nothing, feeling just really, I did feel something, but it was feeling hopeless. I was praying, God, would you give peace to his mind and shalom to his mind? And that was the prayer. And uh, I went for quite a while thinking that nothing had happened. And every now and then I would look back and, and wonder, whatever happened to him? And about three years later, I got another invitation to a different church in the same county. And uh, I had never met, I thought I'd never met any of these people. They just contacted me through Global Awakenings email and set it up and I was going to minister there. And I, I pull in with my wife into Lancaster County, go to the house because I was going to have dinner with the pastors before the meeting that night. And we pull in, we park, and as we're walking up to the door, he comes back to mind. And I said, I wonder whatever happened to Jackson. I open the door, and who greets me is Jackson's mom. Right after, I mean, think about the, the, the chances of that. Whatever happened to him, and there's his mom three years later in the doorway. So I found out they had branched off from the other church I was a part of, and they were the new pastors who had planted this church. And they intentionally didn't tell me to surprise me. <laughs> so she's standing there, and I'm, I, it was the most awkward interaction ever. I didn't even say hello. I was so shocked when she opens the door and holds out her hand, and I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me. And I go in, and I sit down at the table, and they're talking, and I'm just, I'm kind of checked out because I'm just trying to wrap my head around the fact that this is happening. And I hear her call, Jackson, and he runs in from the other side of the house, sits down next to me, completely 100% healed. And I found out that although I didn't know anything happened, over the span of six months, he was getting better, 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 better until they were called in, and they said, we have to pull him from the classes that he's in because he's tutoring all of the other kids in special education and doing their work for them. So that he, he moved from there into now being in the highest percentile in the gifted program in the county because of how healed his mind was, completely medically, psychiatrically discharged, 100% healed, 100% symptom-free since that 30-second prayer of peace to his mind. I could tell you stories all day long of what the Lord does. 
through these moments of weakness. <clears throat> I'll tell you this last one and then pray for you. <clears throat> I was planning on sharing one on, on evangelism, but I, I feel the Lord pulling me in a different direction. I, 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 in 2021, in September, I was in Brazil, and we had this incredible meeting where um, the power of God was just really in a, really showing out. The Lord was really showing out. I'll say that. We got to the end of the meeting, and I was brought over to this man to, to pray for him, and I could see that he was in a wheelchair, and then I found out that he was a paraplegic, and he had been injured seven years earlier. He worked in construction, and I think he wasn't wearing a safety harness up on some scaffolding. He slipped and fell down four stories, I think, three or four stories, and on the way down, hit his back on one of the steel beams, and it severed his spinal cord. And his children at the time were all really babies and just a very grim diagnosis for him, as you can imagine. But the power of the Lord was so present there. There was a great deal of faith in myself and my translator that was with me. And we prayed for him and saw him stand up and walk. It was the first person that I ever saw healed who was a paraplegic. Now, that happens in that dynamic atmosphere. Just a few weeks later, I was asked to go and minister in Kona, uh, at, with, with youth, uh, with a mission, with any, if you've, any of you are familiar with YWAM, I was ministering there in the complete opposite atmosphere in this one group than Brazil. In Brazil, there's just this dynamic Holy Spirit activity in the room. The measure of faith on the people there is so high. The worship is just off the charts. And you felt like heaven was so near that anything can happen. This particular group that I was ministering to were largely European atheists, Dutch Reformed, many of them. And everything that I was saying, you could tell, was sort of coming on them with an attitude that was like, impress me. They didn't believe anything that I was saying. And uh, I began to just share with them some of those stories that happened in Brazil. And one of them was that story that I just told you. Now, I felt... Again, no faith. That it was really a moment of weakness. I felt like, I don't know why they invited me here. They're not believing anything I'm saying. And a big part of me was like, oh, God, I just want to go home. And I, I shared, nevertheless, this story of what just happened in Brazil. And this it wasn't, I wasn't planning on including this, but I'll share it. Uh, the way that everything really broke open in that little group that I was, I was ministering to them for a week teaching on theology of healing and practice of healing. Later that night, what broke things open was not anything to do with my message. It was just an intervention of the Holy Spirit. There was a guy seated in the back. His name was Jonas. He was the most against me. And uh, in the middle of me sharing, he jumps up and he does this. Ah! And he starts yelling in German. I don't speak German. I couldn't understand a word of it. So I, I didn't know what was going on. He wasn't holding on to his arm for very long, so I thought he's just mad at me because he was, I mean, he was just beside himself. And then I'm thinking, oh, now I really want to go home. <laughs> Some of the other girls started to weep, translating what he was saying because what happened was in the middle of me sharing, he felt like an ice bucket was dumped onto his arm. And a week earlier, he had been cooking with some friends and had hot oil spill all over his arm that left a big, painful scar and when he felt that ice, he looked down and the scar was gone. Wow. No one prayed for him, no word of knowledge. It wasn't my faith. You know, and I, I, I want to, in some ways, now the, hold us in attention with all the principles necessary for the elevating of faith, especially for healing and all those things. But I also, on the other side of that, want to impart faith to you for when you don't feel faith. There's an old Baptist hymn that the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and that's true. That's true. And even in things like these incredible worship experiences, conferences, you've got to remember the same Holy Spirit is with you after the high of that conference is over. The anointing of God on your life runs deeper than an emotional high. He loves your emotions, again, but in, even when you're in the pit, he's with you. He's just as much with you, and I can testify to having seen that time and time and time again. So that breaks open the meeting, and uh, we come to the end of the week, and there's a girl 
And once again, in the middle of me sharing, she jumps up. This time her phone is ringing. She looks alarmed and she runs out of the room. And I'm thinking, oh, what is it now? She comes back in and she is just beside herself. She's hysterical. And I'll give you the quick rundown of this story. She said, I just got off the phone with a friend of mine in Dallas who's been healed. And I said, what was he healed of? She said, he was healed six days ago. And we worked out the time difference. He was healed at the exact time when I shared that story in Kona in Texas. He was an atheist. He was a friend of hers. They hadn't even really spoken in quite some time, but she used to pray for him a lot. I said, what was he healed of? And she said, he was a paraplegic. He worked in construction. He fell. He severed his spinal cord. And he, he literally wakes up from his sleep and he's healed in Dallas while I'm sharing that story in Kona and you want to talk about again there not being faith involved I didn't know he existed he didn't know I existed he was an atheist he didn't have faith in God to heal him faith in the existence of God I didn't have any measure of faith for him to get healed in Dallas with me sharing a story like that in Texas but God just did it It, one of of my favorite statements that Randy makes is, is this How much faith did Lazarus have? So this guy gets healed and gets saved and starts a Bible study. And seeing people come to the Lord by just sharing what happened with him. As you can imagine, the impact of everybody that was in his life that knows him. We hope you enjoyed this message today and that you connected with Jesus. If this message has changed your life and you accepted Jesus as your Savior, you can text the word NEW LIFE to the number 618-243-0900. We would love to celebrate with you. If you would like to give to the ministry of The Roads Church, visit our website www.theroads.church for all of our giving options. We would also like to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive notifications of our Sunday live services and to discover more of Pastor Chad's teachings. And now we pray that you experience God's presence throughout your day.